So I don't, I don't take it um, lightly to, to stand and speak. It's always a privilege to do that and an honor to do that uh, and to, to speak on, on God's behalf. So, um, so let's pray. I just thank, thank you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified today, that you would be glorified today, and that I would speak the things that you would want me to speak and that it wouldn't be me that it would be you speaking to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, just to, you know, many, many times in Christian circles and churches, uh, people will say things uh, enough times, enough times that, that you actually think that it's in the Word or in the Bible. And sometimes it's not. And I'd, I'd like to pick on one thing, and, and there is some truth in this. There is a lot of truth in this, but I'd like to just pick on one thing where it says that um, prayer precedes every revival. And I would like to change that to say obedience precedes every revival. If you look in, in the, the book of Acts, God told the people, the, the apostles, go wait. Now, while they were waiting, they were praying. <laughs> but he told them, go wait. Yes. And I'd just like to say that, you know, in, in our lives, it's personal and in the church, you know, revival, our obedience to what God shows us to do is the thing that always precedes revival. And it's in the scriptures, too, about how... Uh, God was more concerned with just obedience. Just do, do what I say. Just do what I say. So um, I want to give you a short uh, update on the Big E. Um, this has been a journey, a good journey. Um, so I believe all of you know about what's happened so far. We had a booth, and then the booth got canceled, and through some very gracious circumstances of the Lord, we ended up getting a, a really great spot at the Big E. And we're giving out these testaments, small green testaments. So when the Lord opened a door for us to do that, we just said, sure. Now, the testaments, the booth costs are about 5000 bucks. The testaments are going to be about $36,000. I have no idea where we're going to get the money to do that. But the Lord opened the door. Absolutely, we're going to go there and do that. So we've given out 3,600. What's that? He will provide. Amen. So, so we've given out 3,600 testaments in the first two days. We had seven people actually pray to receive Christ at the fair. And then we had so many good conversations with people. So many good conversations where in the back of the Testament, there's the plan of salvation. There's a prayer of salvation. And I'd say we had, at least personally, I have at least another half a dozen people who said, yeah, I'm going to go home and read that and pray that when I get home. So we just praise God for what He's doing. We praise God for what He's doing. And so this is my shameless advertisement. <laughs> If you have 500 bucks, if you've never written a check for $500 or $5,000 or $10,000, and God nudges you to do that, don't do it if God's not showing you. Don't do that. But if God nudges you to do that, go for it. Go for it. God's going to provide. He's good. He is good. And so um, we're going we're gonna to start, we're going to read, spend most of our time in Genesis chapter 12 in a very familiar story. <laughs> And, um, and I'm going to speak just for a little bit about uh, a book that I read many years ago. I don't usually have books that I would recommend reading, but there are two that I would recommend if you, that have been a blessing to me personally. Um, there's a book called The Kneeling Christian which is by an unknown author. I think he was from the 1800s, maybe early 1900s. Very, very good. And you can get it for free on Amazon if you have, the Kindle, if you have a Kindle, or it's a couple bucks if you want to buy it. 
And I have a few copies of it. If you guys want a copy of it, I can get it for you. And the second one is, is a book called Experiencing God uh, by Henry Blackaby. And his whole tenet is that, and, and precepts of the book, is that God wants us to experience Him in our daily walk. He said it's great if you read a book about what a father is. But if you never had a, a conversation or never engaged in a relationship with your father, it would only be a book that you're reading and you wouldn't have the actual experience of experiencing what it's like to be a child or if you've never had children and you read books on parenting and you read books on, on different subjects and you, if you never experienced uh, what hearing from God is and obeying Him and coming to know the voice of the Lord, it's really just reading stuff out of a textbook. And how many people like reading textbooks? Not really. We like the experiential nature. And so God is a very, God of a very experiential nature. One of the things that He says is that, uh, you know, it's a nuance that sometimes we pray. Lord, show me what your will is for me. And he said, you know, it centers our thoughts on us then, as opposed to, Lord, what's your will? And then if you know his will is here, then you go over into his will, as opposed to, what's your will for me? Just get into his will. And so... One of the things that's important to me is that we become witnesses for Christ. And so that's why a lot of the things that you hear me speaking about and encouraging people is, how do you become a witness for Christ? And so um, that's why we have events like the Big E and the, the Gideons, is to get us out of the church and to become witnesses, actually talk to people about Christ. And it's a learning experience. It's unnerving at first. But you know what? If God shows you to do it, just do it, and He'll show you how to do that. So, um, but beyond that, what God wants God wants us to experience and, and just to grow in our relationship. And and when God speaks to us, we don't have any choice but to obey. Uh, you know, uh, what if God tells you to do something and you say? Well, that's, that's too hard. That's too great a sacrifice. Or um, then uh, it, it always costs more when you don't obey God than when you do obey God. When you obey God, it's going to cost you something. You've got to stick your neck out. I mean, we stuck our neck out here at the Big E about this far. But if we didn't do that, it would cost more in terms of God's kingdom and His glory. So it always costs you something when God shows you to do something, but it costs you more if you don't do that. And so, so how do you hear from God? You know, again, practically, turn off the noise. There's a lot of noise. We have the election coming up. It's very stimulating to watch the blow, blow by blow. If you already know who you're going to vote for, <laughs> Just pray and turn the noise off. Amen. And just listen to him. Read his word. You know, it doesn't take... I mean, I already know, I knew two years ago who I was going to vote for. So <laughs> I don't need to continually punish myself uh, with the, the back and forth. And it is stimulating to do that. But uh, I would just say, spend time with God. Spend time with him. And that'll be far more beneficial for your, your soul and for the things that you do in life. So, so we're going to read in Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 12. And this is a story, no doubt, you're familiar with. It's the story of Abraham. And so, for some reason, God took Abraham out of the stream of humanity and just put him aside. And out of the millions and millions of people at that time, he picked Abraham. Why did he pick Abraham? I have no idea why he picked Abraham. He just said, I'm going to do something for you. 
And I always wonder whether God had other people that he had picked who just didn't follow God, who didn't have that experiential knowledge of God. And where did they end up? The Bible doesn't say anything about that. But the Bible says in Genesis 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I'll show you. So here, um, imagine if, if God spoke to you and you were Abraham. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Lord, do you know, Lord, I'm 75 years old? Aren't I a little old to be doing this, God? I mean, you want me to get up and go? And, and can you tell me where I'm going? I'd really like to know where I'm going before you send me there. <laughs> Pack your bags, go to Bradley, and I'm going to tell you what plane to get on. But just go. Okay, it sounds like a great plan, God. Can you tell me where I'm going? I'm not going until you tell me where I'm going. And besides that, you know, can I go next week? Because this week I got stuff going on and I got a few things I got to take care of. And, it, you know, when God speaks, a lot of times it requires action. It requires going and doing. And, you know, can you imagine Jesus, Jesus speaks to Peter? Uh, hey, come on, follow me. Uh, I don't want to get out of the boat. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm a fisherman. Have you seen what I do? I'm not really that equipped. And Moses was kind of the same story, right? Moses is 80 years old. God, I'm too old. And heaven forbid, you know, I turned 62 this year. And I have more now to offer uh, the world more now to offer the church than I did 20 years ago. I have far more experience. I have far more understanding. I have more experience with the Lord. And I have far more understanding of, of uh, what things are like walking with the Lord. And I, I can be more beneficial to the kingdom today than I ever could uh, 20 years ago. So, you know, he didn't tell him where he's going. And... and um, you know, it's very similar with our experience coming here to, to Otis Congregational Church. We had been attending Bethany Assembly. I got saved at Bethany Assembly of God. I went to an altar in 1984 uh, and stood at an altar on the right-hand side of the congregation, and that's where I, I confessed Christ. And, and, so, and then we had, we had been going there until... We moved here. So we moved here in 2018, and right at the beginning of 2019, I felt like the Lord showing us, come here. And I like the stories that Chip tells about how God showed him, come here, come here. And, you know, we had relationships, and we had people that we knew, and it was, it was tough because... Uh, we, we had all these, but we felt like the Lord was coming here. So he said, well, Lord, what do, what do you want us to do? And, and again, I felt like the Lord said, just be helpful. So here we are, being helpful. Hallelujah! <laughs> it, it's nothing more than that. Go to, I felt like he wanted us to be part of a local congreg congregation and just be helpful. So, so that's our experience. There's a little more to it than that. But, so um, I would like to take you back. I was reading in the Word earlier this year, and I just want to take you back to the end of uh, chapter 11. It says in Ter uh, verse 31, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and uh, Sarah his daughter-in-law, <laughs> his son's Abram's wife, and they went forth for, with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And it says a little bit before that, uh, verse 28, Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So here, here um, Haran, his father Terah starts out to go to Canaan where, where Abraham ends up 
actually going. And so I just noticed that, that this year that possibly the Lord called his father to go. Maybe the Lord called him to go. And his son died and may, you know, and he ends up ending up in this land that he names his son for. He ends up in Haran, the, the land that his, he names his, fa his son after. And his son died. And, you know, it, it, is, it is one of the saddest things in Christian walk where someone starts out in the will of God and then the dream dies. And they end up just stopping before they actually get where God told them to go. And, and I think that's what happened here with his father. His father, you know, started going to, to the promised land. And somewhere along the way, he just stopped. Doesn't say why he stopped. You could speculate on that. Um, but he did stop, after all. And... <laughs> In our lives, we don't want to we don't want to stop when God chose us to go. So, so then we we read, you know, go go where I'm I'm showing you to go. I'm going to show you. Don't worry. You just go. <laughs> just go. Get on your bike. Get in your car and drive. And I'll make a great nation of thee, and I'll bless you, and make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I'm going to bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a very popular and famous saying. So, so God's promise is to bless you know, the people. And so while we apply that generally to Israel, today we're going to apply that to us personally. Not just generally to, to Israel. And so, so here Abraham departs, verse 4, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And so, so here, God tells Abraham, leave your family. Leave your family. Go. And what does, what does Abraham do? He brings his, his nephew along. So maybe he felt sorry for his nephew. Maybe his nephew said, hey, can I come with you? And he's like, eh, I guess so. Yeah, come on along. And, and if you look at the history of Lot, he never really embraced the promises of God. He didn't embrace the ways of God. Uh, he, he became nothing but trouble for Abraham in his life. And even later on in the scriptures, it said he went after the best land and he, he was seduced into living in, in the wickedest city on the world. So here Abraham brings this nephew along who God didn't tell him to bring. And he brought him anyways. And then there was this tension between them, even to the point where he said, you know, the older guy is saying, hey, you, you pick whichever land you want. And, and the right thing to do, think about it, you're, I don't know, 80 years old by that time. Can you imagine telling your nephew, hey, you pick whatever you want? And your nephew says, sure, I'm going to take that. What the nephew should have said was, no, you pick. <laughs> this is your journey. You pick. But no, he does. And then after this, you know, the descendants of Lot, uh, the Moabites and the Amorites, then for decades continue to grieve Israel over the promised land that God promised to Abraham, not to Lot. And so, so Abraham dra drags this guy Lot along, and, and the result was trouble. <laughs> so... It's important to obey God. When he shows you to do something, obey him. But obey him and don't, don't add to things or take things away. You know, you don't want to do partial obedience and just say, well, God, I'm only going to go about this far until you show me some more. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to add a few other things to what you showed me to do. And so it, it just turns into problem. 
So God says to him, hey, the place I'm bringing you, it's a good place. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be blessed. You'll be glad you went. Everyone around you is going to be blessed. I'm going to make a blessing to those if you just follow me. If you just obey me, everyone's going to be blessed. And, it, and by implication, if you don't follow me, people are going to suffer. People around you are going to suffer. When you, when you don't follow God, your, your family suffers. The people around you suffer when you don't. You see it in people's lives where if you, if you start off following God and then you divert and you, you, you go wrong, the people around you end up, end up suffering. And we want to be a blessing, right? So we want to have the character of Abraham when he's following God. Yes, Lord, I hear what you say. I'm going to go do it. And I'm not going to add to it, and I'm not going to take away from it, because I know that if I follow God, I'm going to be blessed, and my family's going to be blessed around me. So, verse 7, so he goes into the land, verse 6, of Sychem, Sychem, in the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was in the land. So he, gets to, he finally gets to Canaan. And when he gets there, the Lord affirms, he said, unto thy seed I will give the land there. And so Abraham built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So God appears to him before he goes, and then, then he, 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 he reaches Canaan and Sychem. He builds an altar because there's no church there. There's no church. So he takes some stones, he builds an altar, and he builds a stone altar, which is good because it's not a wood altar which decays over time. Stone altar, so it's always going to be there. And then verse 8, he went to Bethel, put his tent there, and then he does the same thing. He builds an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And so, so, so he, God's affirming himself through this this journey that uh, Abram's on. And it's a good journey so far. It's a good journey so far. So, so usually people stop there and they, they talk about, there we go, we're in the promised land, we're good. But then, there's a famine in the land. So you get to the place where God calls you and there's a famine. And have you ever taken a step of faith and then life gets harder for you instead of easier? So you take a step of faith and all of a sudden there's a famine in the land. And Abram, uh, did, did God tell Abram, hey, why don't you go down to Egypt for a while? I hear, I hear things are pretty good over there. So, um, you know, Sometimes we take a little break from what God shows us. Lord, I know you showed us me to give, or I know you showed me to, to read the word every day, or I know you showed me to, to uh, pray every day. I committed to doing that, but you, you don't know what I've been going through. I've, I have some problems. I have some trouble that's going on, and, and I, I just need to take a little break for a while. And... Um, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not a good place to be. Let's see what happens to Abraham when he took a little break. He went down to Egypt to sojourn there, and the land was, for the famine was grievous. And it came to pass when he was come to Egypt, near enter into Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, Behold, you're a fair woman to look on. Now, why don't you lie and tell the Egyptians that uh, when they see you, that you're beautiful, they're going to kill me. So, so I want to save my skin there, honey. So why don't you lie a little bit and say you're my sister, and it's going to be well with me, and my soul shall live because of you. Just tell, just tell them that. And so, so it came to pass when Abraham, so this is the low point of Abraham's life, okay? where they came into there, and of course the Egyptian, she was a beautiful woman. Now, now i just like to say, he was, he was good here in some of this stuff. He said to his wife, 
hey, you're a good looking girl. So it's okay to tell your wife you're a good looking girl, okay? Hey, you're good looking. <laughs> but don't follow it with, can you lie for me? <laughs> So here he is, he tells them, and, and they came to Egypt, and the princes of Pharaoh saw her also, and then they commended her. And, and, uh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house and entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses, manservants, maidservants, she has camels. So, so here, <laughs> here Abraham is, if I could be so crass, he pimps his wife out into the harem of Pharaoh and he makes money and he's blessed. He's like, man, I am richer than I've ever been. He sends his wife and, and his poor wife's probably running around trying to avoid Pharaoh, you know, like ducking and, and you know, trying not to get in his eyesight. And here Abraham is, you know, it doesn't say, hey, I, I, I thought I should go see how my wife's doing. He's here counting his money. He's here counting his money, right? That's what it says. And, it's, and, and you know what? If you read further on when they talk about Hagar, who is an Egyptian slave, he was given manservants and maidservants she asks and camels. So this is where he picks up Hagar, is right here. So first of all, he picks, brings Lot with him. And then he picks up Hagar here. He comes with him. And, and between the two of them, they're nothing but trouble for generations and generations. I would say even today. Those bad decisions, the bad decisions that we make, plague us. I don't know. If, uh, bad decisions. I always pray. I mean, I pray. Gretchen will tell you this. I pray every morning, God, help me to make good decisions because I don't want to make bad decisions. Because then I have to live with the consequences. My family has to live with the consequences. So here, here, you know, here's, here's Abram. Man, I'm getting rich. Things are going good with me. And, uh, you know, so, you know, his decision to go there was based on fear. And when we make decisions based on fear or circumstances, we can, we can go into some really dark places. So, so what's Abraham supposed to be? What did God say to Abraham? You're going to be what? But what does he say? You're going to be a blessing. You're going to be a blessing. So let's see. Hey, Pharaoh... How's things going since that Hebrew came to live with you? And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. Hey, Egyptians, how's things going since that Hebrew, Abraham, came to live with you? You feeling blessed? Hey, honey, how's Sarah? How you doing since we came to here? Are you feeling blessed there, Sarah? Are they blessed? Yeah. They're not blessed. Yeah. They, they disobeyed God. And they weren't blessed. So, the, so when we say that Abraham is a blessing, he's a blessing as long as he obeys God. In our lives, obedience always precedes revival. You've got to get the obedience right. If we don't get the obedience right, we're not going to be blessed. So, so here his wife is uh, carted off. And then it's really, really a bad shape when the Pharaoh, the unbeliever, says to him, rebukes him. So you got the, the guy who's called by God, the Pharaoh. You know, at least this Pharaoh had better sense than the other Pharaoh with Moses' time. This guy's like, hey, what are you doing to me? Why didn't you tell me that this was your wife? You told me she was your sister. And Pharaoh commanded, verse 20, Hey, send them away, far away. Send them back. And so this Pharaoh at least had a little better sense than the other, the other Pharaoh. So, so how do you know if you're... How do you know if you're in God's will? And I would just say... Is your family blessed? 
Is your family blessed? If you, if you on your job, if your boss says, boy, I wish I had another hundred people in my employment that were just like your neighbors, man, that is, is, man, what a great neighbor. I wish all our neighbors were like him. Your coworkers, and, and you know, when you're, when you're obeying God, you, even though you're going through trouble, you have this, this, if you obey God and follow Him consistently over a long period of time, you'll be blessed. You will be blessed. And you'll have some bumps in the road. God, there's trials that you'll have. So, so what did Abraham do? And this is a good, you know, if, if God called you to do something, and maybe it was 20 years ago, maybe it was five years ago, and then you left off doing it, the best place to go back to is the place, the last place that God called you to. So, so what does Abraham do? He, he goes back with Lot, and he says, verse 3, he went back to Bethel. He went back to Bethel, the place where the altar was. And unto the place of the altar, verse 4, this is chapter 13, verse 4, which he had made there. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. He goes back to the place where he was at. And then he divides from Lot. And at this point, he, he's just like, hey, I'd rather be in the desert with God than be in this good place without God. And I'd rather be in a, a hard place with God than, than out in the green pastures without Him. And so after Lot leaves, right? So Lot leaves. And Lot leaves kind of through verse 13 and verse 14 and the Lord said unto Abraham after Lot was separated from him and the promise is renewed and God starts speaking to him again he got back to the place where he was supposed to be of obedience and that's where God speaks to us is when we're in a place of obedience and when we wander here and we wander there and maybe the obedience is I'm going to read your word every day. I'm going to read your word every day, Lord. I'm going to pray every day. And maybe that's the place where you need, you need to be. I know it's the place where I need to be. And the Lord said unto Abraham after Lot was separated, Lift up your eyes. Look from the place where you are, north, south, east, and west. For all the land which you see, to you I'm going to give it, and to your seed forever. And so this is the point where he finally separates from his nephew and the point where he's supposed to be in the Lord. And then Abraham grows into the man that God intended him to be. It's kind of lumpy. Our walk with the Lord can be kind of lumpy where we, we, uh, you know, we, we have our ups and downs. And, and uh, I would just encourage you, you know, uh, Go back to the place where God called you from. So, so I'd ask you just a few questions. Is your, is your life in Canaan or is your life in Egypt? I can't answer that for you. I can answer it for me. I can't answer it for you. And, and, and can you honestly say my life is a blessing to those around me? To my family and my workers? Am I, am I really in the place where I need to be? And then... Uh, if it's not, do you need to go back to Bethel? Do you need to go back to the last place where the Lord was rich in your life and the Lord was um, calling you to? And those are questions for you. I can't, can't answer those questions. But if you do need to go back to Bethel, we're going to pray. And uh, we're going to get there. And I, I just know it's, it's always better to... Even though you don't see the, the end of things, just to follow God and trust Him. And as Bud says, trust, trust me. Two words, trust me. Trust God. Trust Him. And we want to trust God.
He'll never lead us into a place that is is bad for us. Uh, if we if we don't obey him, that's where things. It's going to be. It might be tough. Life is tough. It's not a not an easy sometimes. But if we follow God, it's always better than not following him. It's always harder if you don't follow God. Life is always harder if you don't follow him. So, so let's pray. So, let's just pray, Lord. I just pray, Father, that we would um, go back to the place where you've called us to. I pray, Father, that uh, myself, my family, this congregation, the people here, would um, be able to discern the voice of the Lord. Your word says that uh, you're the good shepherd and we won't hear the voice of another. Help us, Father, to turn down all the other voices, to turn off all the other voices in the world, to simply hear your voice, Father, and what you're calling for us to do. What you're calling for us to do, Father, as a people. We pray for this community, Father. Same thing that you showed me, just to be helpful. I pray, Father, that we would be useful, Father, sanctified, useful for the Master, prepared for every good work, and that our, in our community that we would be sanctified, set apart for you, that we would be useful, Father, to this community, and that we would always be ready, prepared for every good work, Father. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen.